Good. Okay. So welcome everybody to Linda's wonderful, wonderful book on the six macaques and oh gosh, Linda, it's called the remind me the name it the transformation the story of transformation from lab primates to animal ambassadors. And isn't that the truth? <laughs> it's the truth, yes. And, and actually, with, with this lovely uh, group, um, I had a suggestion from, some, from uh, Jessie Br uh, uh, Brader, who just got her own little children's book published a few weeks ago. She thinks we should change the um, title to just Animal Ambassadors, because I realized we kind of did it under a uh, real rush, and I was to get it out. And I was, I was pretty uh, overloaded at the time. And I didn't realize that a lot of people don't know what a macaque is. It wasn't the most brilliant thing. And Jesse said, my God, the whole thing, it's really about being animal ambassadors. Why don't you just call it that? So I'm going to put it out to Jewel and all of you who are listening because it's easy enough to change the title. And I think that's what we should actually do. That's what they were. Read the book. So amazing how many how many lives they touch not just from the children who came to be with them that Carol hosted from various schools but also I, I had just forgotten about the vets and the director of the program at Hunter College and all these um, people who first of all thought why the heck well the one woman who just thought one director why don't we just put them down that'll you know What's the point? And she really changed her mind after seeing how they changed and, and the lives that they they touched just from their their presence. Yeah, the the adults, the children, the kitten, mm -hmm. the puppy, each other. You know, of course, which got me thinking, so even if they couldn't see each other in the cage is from where they were, how much communication did they go to to communicate with each other and still be one? Exactly. I mean, that's the thing that was so interesting with the whole program. I'd love to know what some of the one of some of your impressions were of the book. I, I don't know. I'm I'm very deeply touched by it every time I go over it again. I was so glad I had to read it again twice for this book club because every time I do, I think we really made a major move. I mean. When I first, actually, I want to talk about it a little. When I first uh, was invited by the vets at Sloan Kettering to uh, come and meet them because they had to meet me and they had no idea what Tellington Teach what Touch was and what did I have in mind for them and should they release them to me. When you read how uh, deeply touched they were by it, it was really impressive. And I have to say... It's a practice to go there under the streets of New York City with 2,000 animals there for research. Um, not just many, many macaques, but dogs and cats and mice and all kinds of beings. And so the only way I could do that was to go in holding the infinite possibility yeah. for somehow for us to wake up and find ways that we can now use you know computer research and not not work in this way with the animals and and that's my prayer and it's the ho'oponopono it's the forgiveness that we what we all participate in because you know every time you buy a product that's been tested on an animal so i i, I didn't want to go there at all in the book i wanted to really um, in the newsletters that I wrote, it was always focused on just the magic uh, uh, in the lives that they touched and the interspecies connections. I mean, it was wild. The first time <coughs> a kitten in and put this tiny, it was about a four week old kitten, I forget the name <coughs> that brought in, and put it down in the middle of my office floor. <gasps> Oh, and Gaia, she was so excited, and you could just see her little being get all excited, and then she started to approach the kitten, and the, Pah! I mean, suddenly, the kitten was like, all its hair, her hair was straight up. She was a ball of, like, get away from me, and Gaia instantly stopped, 
turned away, and I wish you could see me, because she turned away, and she went, and then turned her head away, and would go, and turn her head away. And she did a circle and then a spiral very slowly. She'd go a few steps, like two or three steps, and then sit down. She'd be looking like straight ahead. Then she'd sit down, look at the kid, and then wait, and then walk a few more steps. And it must have taken her at least 30 minutes till she could go and sit quietly in front of that kitten and then pick her up with no fear on the kitten's part. And when you think of that, um, amazing communication. And this was, a, this was a, a, a macaque who had been captured at four years old. That means she'd never had, you know, a small one. She'd been around them, of course. But for her to know that, how to do that, it's the level of intelligence is deeply, deeply touching. And that's why I'm so happy to have this book out here. And I just, we're hoping that Carol Lang can get on this call at some point because she pulled all of this together and all the beautiful work she did for ages. You know, we brought, I think we'd had the macaques only maybe a month when she came and was with them all the time and did all this beautiful work with the children, bringing the school children in and having them sit and she would tell them animal ambassador stories and teach them tea touch and that they were phenomenal ambassadors. Wow. Wow. Yeah, you know, I have to say it it I was in awe of here you take animals who didn't live a life in which they could interact. And therefore, where are the social skills? And yet, 16 years later, there are the social skills showing up immediately. Exactly. The knowing is so deep, right? And the patience and the ability to have that self-control is really amazing, if you think about it, because... You know, we, we and, and all of the warnings that we got from so many labs, be, because there were huge articles in, in newspapers right. about what we were doing. And we had labs who would call us and say, be very careful, they're very dangerous, da da da. And, and you saw the fact that I had to hold Gaia a couple of times when she was getting treated, and she never thought about biting. That, and then one time when, when uh, I think it was, uh, I forget, Roberta, came and pulled at my shirt. She could have attacked me. She could have bitten me. But she never, ever offered. And that was against everything that I was told by every lab person who called us or wrote us letters offering help. So, you know, that's interesting because when you say that, then I think about how soon you put the toddler. The toddler came close and... So we know that with dogs, we would really be watchful. I mean, you were watchful here, but I would love to hear what your thinking is in the safety of the toddler. Absolutely. And think about um, with a dog, the level of maturity it takes in a dog, because some dogs absolutely know how to be careful. They, They know exactly, just like horses do also with children and that is the thing that i have seen over and over in my life that when you can take a an animal that is considered dangerous and if there's a a baby there or a child there they're really careful it's very different and i was totally you know roland asked me recently okay how do i describe my connection with animals like and and you're asking how did i know that it would be okay with them and it's because I have this deep sense of communication, cell to cell and soul to soul. And I believe that what, that's what was going on in this case. Because you see the pictures, and I'm sorry, you know, and the Kindle, they're tiny, but you, I'm sure, I hope you all know that you just touch them and you can make them big. And some of them have a low enough resolution that they're not necessarily clear, but man, looking, I just so enjoyed going over every one of those pictures and seeing the process that 
was going through with them. Okay, so then that gets me thinking. There's that conversation about the cell to cell and soul to soul and all of us being interconnected. Mm -hmm. And then there's a knowing and, and that's something that you have because in all the animals that you work with, you tend to pull this out in the communication with the animals. It's true. And, and you know how careful I am. Yeah. So, and it's a good question. How did we know that was going to be okay? There was not ever a question in my mind. And I think that's what we do. We create a field. You know, it's just beautiful. This thing that HeartMath has so studied and taught this concept that when we are in heart coherence, I believe there is a sense of, of peace that happens and um, connection and communication that, that is very uh, challenging to describe. I, I'm not sure I could describe it. I think this cell to cell and soul to soul is maybe uh, something that gives us a sense of what we're talking about. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I, I'd love to know what some of our other people are thinking, those of you who are on with the call, what you're thinking about this and, and, and how you, what, what stood out in the book for you? Yeah. Well, this is Kate Reardon. Um, I think that in those situations that you described with the macaques, Linda, is that you trusted them and they had never had an opportunity in their lives to be trusted. And I think that in the quantum field that we are now just beginning to explore, all the opportunities are there. And you gave them an opportunity to uh, display a behavior that they've never been, never been given before. And I think that with your level of trust and your ability, to, well, and we all have the same ability, but you are our leader, of doing that cell to cell and soul to soul, um, communication with them, it gave them an opportunity to be different and to be trusted. And I think that's huge. I mean, and I've seen you mentally give animals permission to respond in a different way in their behavioral patterns. And I think that that's really important that we acknowledge them at a heart level and we give them permission to be, um, to be different in their behavioral patterns. End of my story. Yeah, and I, I agree. And, and it goes back to what I just love, this concept that, that absolute trust comes from being, holding the infinite possibilities. I mean, this quantum science concept of infinite possibilities really changes. Uh, it's, a, it's a game changer, I believe, in levels of trust. Right. And I have to say that I'm still really careful. I would not walk into a tiger, a tiger's den doing this. There's a real difference in, um, and we, we had an opportunity to watch them before and see how they, how um, conscious they appeared to be in their interactions and, 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 aggression free i have to say that when you see how we've been watching them for a few days at that point and there was no sense of aggression between the two of them and otherwise i would not have ever considered doing that mary had had a comment did you see her written comment yes yes is it a physical sense that you're having with the talk? i can't call it a physical sense i can't it's a knowing that is beyond anything that is that I can describe as physical. So, aside from that, what other, what other, what else felt like? What was interesting to you? I, Eleanor, you you said you really enjoyed the book. What was it that got you? Well, you know, in. Um Hold on one second, just going to read her. Always when I've studied with you in all these years, I've always thought, how does this apply 
so obviously and clearly to all animals? And then how does it apply to humans? When I studied animal behavior in college, I thought, wow, that's so much easier than studying psychology and human behavior because this is clearer and more obvious and that's what we're doing anyway. And so then I think in terms of people and animals who've been through trauma. And literally the environment that you set up, the intention that you created And that communication, again, as you say, from cell to cell and and soul to soul, and more than that, there is a healing, and it's not a technique. There's something in your action and in your being, and how can we do that? I mean, then we don't have to go study all these psychology things about working with trauma, because this is it. Well, I think it's about the heart. And, um, and actually, I'm reading this book. I'm wondering if any of you listening have read this book, The Healing Code, by Dr. Ben Johnson. And I forget the, his co-author. I mean, he, he's the, actually the, the developer of the system. Let me get it. Because it all gets down to the heart. And, I mean, this is with heart math. It's, it, the studies, the, the fact that our heart has more intelligence than our head, and our head can get us into so much trouble because of the, con- the subconscious and the unconscious programming that we have, that the heart apparently seems to be immune to when we come to that other level. I, I'm not certain of that, but that's certainly the impression that I have when I, when I trust my heart. Wow. So here I have um, the uh, Alexander Lloyd, PhD and naturopath, and Ben Johnson, MD, Doctor of Osteopathic Medicine and naturopath. Yeah. And if, at some point, I, I'm going to suggest we do a book club on this book because there's so much important information in it. But it's about the heart, and. Um, and that, and to me, that's what these that that's what these amazing six macaques did. They opened the hearts of a lot of people, just as all of our animals open open our hearts. I mean, the heart opening that comes from our interactions with our animals is just um, really important on the planet at this time when we're dealing with so much chaos around us. The fact that we can have these beautiful animals and in this case, taking animals that weren't expected or never thought to have this level of consciousness. You can only call it that when you see the care, the interaction that they did with all of us. I I just, um, I am in absolute awe of the levels of consciousness that animals are um, capable of when we see them, when we see their soul, and when we allow what Roland talks about is this concept of allowing their curiosity to come out when we are with them in this way of acknowledgement. It's very different, and that's why I'm, I'm so grateful to have this book out, and I, I hope you all will tell other people think it gives what does it give what does it give another way of seeing animals that were never never seen or acknowledged in this way huh? Jewel you're so quiet I love your input always do you have any thoughts or well, Oops, I'm actually looking through the book on my Kindle as we're talking about it, and I know you may, you probably don't know, and and certainly most people don't know that when I was about eight or nine, my father actually brought home a monkey that someone had bought from a research facility, so this was in the 60s, Yeah. and in reading the book, it, it struck me you know, it it brought back a lot of childhood memories of her. Um, it, her death was kind of tragic, but, uh, and I won't go into that, but it was very interesting to see her. I mean, she was actually in this tiny, tiny cage when my father brought her home. 
Um, and she was a macaque. And I don't know if you've never been around a macaque, you don't understand how very strong they are and how willful they can be. And they can really hurt you if they want to. She never hurt any of us. She came right out of the cage. She adored my mother. She would sit in my mother's lap for hours Aww. and groom her. And my mom would groom her. And that little noise, that little, with the lip motion, we would do that with her. It was great. Um, she was quite a character. I should maybe write something about some of her exploits. She used to escape and run around town and scare people. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, she sent a German shepherd flying one time when she jumped on its back. Um, but it, just this discussion has really made me realize how much my interaction with her formed a lot of my ability to relate to animals in the way I do. Oh, how beautiful. And uh, yeah, I really, I really enjoyed the book. And it's, you know, and now talking about it, it's, it's really special thinking about her name was bossy, by the way, mm -hmm. that was the name she came with and we never felt the need to change it. Um, and she, she was a bit different from your monkeys. She, she never, as I said, she never hurt us, but she could get into some mischief. Um, and, it, but you know, what a great opportunity to, have had that experience with her. Uh, and I think Animal Ambassadors is a very good name also. Yeah, it's much better, we'll change it. <laughs> so Deb, ha Deb Burke has something I can't wait to share this story with. What else did she write? Oh, yeah. Oh, I just typed it in. Um, the people at uh, the Do animal sanctuary in mount vernon they were the people who were on animal planet this last year and last summer i had an opportunity to do some work with the servals um and saw some really nice change for them but julie and bob are always looking for ways to do enrichment with their with their animals and i just it's another way for me to connect you with them because i think that they could really use tea touch with all of their critters and where are they? They're um, in Maine. Ah. Long way north. Can you get, can, do you live near them? Can you talk to them? I absolutely can. I, um, I was there last week and um, I, I was, I've always offered to do more tea touch with their animals. And I guess she doesn't quite get um, what tea touch can do. So I'm still hoping to, to take that a step further with her. Do you, have you given her my little book that's published by Doubleday, you know, the little paperback that is, um, it, it's just uh, the title, Tellington Tea Touch. Oh my God. Like, um, the, but it, the, little, the little book? Yeah, the little book. Yes. It has stories of my working with the serval at the San Diego's at the zoo park and all those different animals in it. Um, I think, I think I need to give it to her. I've shown it to her, but I haven't given it to her. Yeah. Well, it does work. <laughs> Of course, <laughs> and it can really help in terms of enrichment and and stress reduction, so that the animal's life is enhanced. And that's what I love about T Touch. It enhances life. You know. Yes. It and then all the cellular up. stuff. What? What did you say? And then all the cellular stuff. <laughs> and then all the cellular stuff. Right. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, to me, I know that the, the byproduct of touching this way is enhancing our life. And, and I just, I am forever fascinated down to the intracellular and intercellular that, okay, we can go to that level of what is it doing within the energy storehouses and the cleaning up of the cells and the cellular permeability, and then we can take it to the level of what you talk about, cell to cell and heart to heart or soul to soul, right? So that we can, we can go into the detail and then we can step back and see it this way 
you yeah. can't see my hands anymore. It's so big. <laughs> <laughs> I love the science, the spirituality, the science and the soul. You know, bring it all together. That that is what I believe has for all of us who work closely with T-Touch, that is the excitement for me. Because it's one thing to get it, you know, to see how it happens, but to have explanations for what happens in the cells and how it actually affects the immune systems of the cells and cell function as the pilot study we did with Dr. Pop. I mean, it was one thing for me to say, you know, that I, it's my intention to support the function of the cells. But to actually have us show that it's what happens is, for me, it's a big deal. And getting this book out, I, with, with Carol pulling this book together in this way and then, and then having the idea, I can't remember, maybe it was Kate's idea to, in the back, probably was, to, to list all of the Animal Ambassador projects that we did. I'm so glad that we have that out there. Yes, that's excellent. Yeah. You was. know, um, so it's interesting that you say that because it makes me wonder about we don't have any macaque touches we have abalone we have all the touches of all these other animals that you worked with why did was there any what's that <laughs> I, you'd have to do the hair slides <laughs> wait the circle and the hair slides that would be them got it thank you i'm good <laughs> The little hair slides. Wow. You know, they love to do da -da -da -da, nye, nye, da -da -da, nye, nye. Sometimes they really pulled, as I said. Mm -hmm. You know, it was really interesting. <laughs> and you could sit there. I mean, I could sit there as my mom did also, like for, uh, for it would seem like hours because it's so interesting to have your head worked on to that degree. <laughs> yes, that's the hair stuff. That's the macaque story. And you said, and you said in the book that Sometimes they did that for up to 30 minutes on you. Oh, yeah. Wow. You did there. <laughs> Was that ever too much? No. <laughs> Only yeah. if you had something else to do and the phone was ringing, yes. <laughs> but I wish you could have seen them. I mean, uh, we don't have really uh, clear pictures of the way we picked up uh, eventually the rooms. We had the what we call the condo. You know, we had... We had two separate rooms that they could go out and meet each other and then we had um so that the gaia and um isha could actually roam our whole office if you can imagine two macaques da -da -da -da, walking around the office up and i i put down these plastic runners down the office because it's beautifully carpeted and they never made a mess they the worst thing they ever did, sometimes they'd knock the phone off because they'd be fooling around with it. Or sometimes it wasn't even bad. They'd open the drawer and they'd look in boxes as you see that one box that day. That, But, you know, actually that reminds me of a story. I, I don't think it's in the book. Of um, Can I say something? I'm yeah. not, you know, you just said that in the box and all of that, but in the picture before that was the was her going – into the drawers and you mentioned how she pulled things out but she never broke anything how can that be for animals that spent their whole life living beings that spent their whole life in a cage and didn't learn that interaction to know how to be gentle with your human products it's a really they didn't chew on them they didn't eat them i mean that is really interesting and um, I, it's not explainable, actually. No. Not really. And, and I'm telling you, I was just in the office, because of course I live in Hawaii, and the office is in Santa Fe, and I was with Kirsten a couple of weeks ago in the, in the office, and I'm looking out at the porch, and I'm realizing, what was I thinking, for heaven's sake, because the two of them, Gaia and Isha, could walk out through a cat door in my office onto a back porch, which had a railing, which was like three feet high. And then they had another little um, hole, like they could go down the tree to the bottom where they had, they could, you know, do stuff and there were leaves and things around the bottom of their area. But mostly they hung out with us in different offices. But why didn't they climb over the rail and, and walk away? 
I, I think, oh my God, I'm embarrassed to say that I did that. But it never, I mean, did I, did I just put some kind of a, you know, like, I, I didn't even think don't go over the rail. Never crossed my mind. And they never. But you're saying that was not fenced rail. That was not fenced in? No. <laughs> no. The one on the other side for the four, absolutely fenced in, but not the one for the two that roamed around the office. I don't get it. To this day, when I walked out, I was like sort of in shock. I thought, what? I mean, why didn't we build a fence up there and put a, a top on it? But we didn't. And they never went anywhere. <laughs> Wow. Very strange. Anyway, it was really strange. But I wanted, to, I wanted to tell you a story of what happened one day. Isha was so thin. If you look closely at those pictures, yes. she was really thin. And I got all the records from Hunter College. And, um, and, the, and the records uh, said didn't eat, picky eater, left her food. And they were giving him monkey chow and some sort of pellets, you know. And she, so when she came to us, I thought, oh, not a problem, you know. We had every day, we had different choices because in those days you could go to um, the equivalent of Whole Foods, I forget the name of the health food store in Santa Fe, and they would throw out all the vegetables or fruits that were a little like a day over. And we were allowed to go through and pick through and take them home. And so every day they got different choices of food. And it was fascinating to watch. Like I remember watching, I think it was Isha. She took a cherry in her mouth, put the stem down, and then she's moving her lips around. And then she spits out the seed. And then the skin. God. <laughs> yeah. And she only ate the, you know, main part of the cherry. And she would just do it like really carefully. And to watch her take, oh my God, it was so amazing. To watch them take a corner of the cob and just so enjoy, you know, like eating that, holding it in two hands uh, with the little fingers up. I want to. to Are you kidding? Um, they extended the you. Yes. I can't remember. I don't know that they all did it, but several of them, they were definitely, must have been the British background. I don't know. Totally British macaque. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but. Isha wouldn't eat. And so she'd take it. The cherries, that was actually her favorite, I remember. So she'd take something and she'd take a few bites and throw it down. So I had our, our vet, who was a holistic vet. Um, oh my gosh, at the moment I can't think of her name. She's so wonderful. Will come to me. She's a holistic vet in Santa Fe, who's I believe now retired, and she's just wonderful. So she she came in and she sat on the floor in my office, and um, Isha was wandering around, and so she was going to figure out a homeopathic, you know, a homeopathic little pill to give her that would get her to eat. And, and I thought, oh, right, this is going to work, right? So she asked lots of questions, and, and she was around us and in the room with us, just, you know. So after, I don't know, maybe 20, 30 minutes of asking me and, and want, observing uh, Isha, she picked out like 10 little tiny white pills. I don't remember what they were. Put them on a paper plate, put them on the floor in front of her. And I thought, yeah, right, she's going to eat those because she didn't. She was so picky. She looked up, she walked over, put one after the other, all 10 in her mouth, went over, picked up a potato and ate the whole potato. That was the first time she'd never taken food and like discarded it. Me And from that day on, she ate everything we gave her. Really? Unbelievable. So for, and, and, and actually I understood that this was a, case that was used because it's absolute proof that homeopath homeopathy is not a placebo because she doesn't know what we're doing at least either that or the level of consciousness is so <laughs> so amazing that it's beyond our imagination yeah. wow. what are those little white pills for yeah. so that is uh, really incredible you're talking about working on a vibrational frequency level. That's it. We're looking at the frequency. <laughs> you love that one. I know. <laughs> level of medicine. Medicine. Beyond. No, it's beyond medicine. Way beyond. Way beyond. Well, maybe we're the new medicine 
meets the soul medicine Absolutely. from a thousand years ago. So I would love to hear just to like any other parts. I, I so enjoy going over and reading all these things, you know. Oh, and and um, actually, while I remember it, I want to say um, how how um, grateful I am to Carolyn Bosian because I met her first when I was giving a presentation at the Washington National Zoo, and I was working. Uh, I was asked to work on an elephant who um, they had to draw blood every week. I can't remember why. And um, she would be afraid. And so the vein would flatten in her ear and they couldn't get blood. It was really a problem. So I just, it was really simple. And we have, this is one I don't have any pictures of. I'm so sorry because I just took a warm washcloth and did circles with the washcloth and she really liked it. It was very quiet. And she, while I was doing her ear, she took her trunk and she was just like nah, 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 touching my ear so gently with the very tips of her trunk while I was doing this. And what happened because of the warmth, the blood vein stood out. And she wasn't afraid either because it was really soothing. And that's how they managed to get the blood so easily after that. They continued to do it. But anyway, Caroline at that time was looking after, um, I, can, I forget what species it was. It says in the books, but I don't remember. Um, anyway, she was really concerned about what happens to research animals um, after they're retired from research. And she wanted to do something about it, and she believed that if she wasn't didn't have a PhD degree, that what anything she would say would be useless. And so, um, she 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 called me one day out of the blue, and you know asked me, um, just because I met her there and and we connected, and did I think she should leave these particular primates and go and study at Hunter College? And I really encouraged her to do that to make a difference in the whole field and she did it and then one day she called me from hunter saying that the they run out of um their funding and rather than using these mechanics now for psychology in the psychology department they were going to send for biomedical research and that's how all this story happened and i flew back met them at the at hunter college then i went again another time and met the vets there and they were wonderful, really interested. And at the time, they were willing to try to find somebody who could go in and have the, you know, background to work in the lab and actually bring T-Touch to their macaques because they were very impressed with it. But we tried it with Caroline, and it just never worked. And she went on, did get her PhD. And actually, the very interesting thing is that a few years ago, when Roland and I were in South Africa, we went to uh, visit a woman who runs a really big um, rescue center there in Sueto, Sueto, and Caroline Bosian walked in the door, and she is now living uh, outside of Johannesburg, running an orphanage. Wow! But I haven't sent her this book yet. I'm so excited. I, after we get off, I'm going to send this to her. Wow! Well, so Linda. Can, I didn't get to the very end of the book, so my question to you, because I wasn't sure whether you wrote about it, how long did the other macaques live, and how are they doing, and or how, how long, how did that go, because you never intended on all of them being there? No, well, what happened is, at one point, and I don't even remember, I, I should memorize the date, um, Gaia, and I think she was, I mean, she was there quite a few years, started to get a respiratory problem and get, you know, sicker and sicker. And, and um, it's such a beautiful thing. Maybe some of you read it where the, it was the day before she died. Um, she actually, the child, a group of children who'd been there before came and they sang her a song and they said that they would guide her to the other side and Carol guided them in this beautiful process. These are wonderful children. Um, and, um, and then she took her last breath. I wasn't there. Carol and a couple of the others, I can't remember who all was there, were there when she took her last breath and we buried her. And then we started looking around um, for another place for them that had more room. And we found, I can't remember, I have to look and see, I don't remember where they went, but they went to a really good place. And um, we kept track of them for quite a few years, but 
uh, as far as I know, they're all crossed the Rainbow Bridge by this time. Yeah, because it's so many years later. So in the early 90s. Well, yeah, and by the early 90s, you said she was already 23 right. at that point. Yeah. Um, okay, so, but did the other, so, the, wow, I am, yeah, I am impressed that you brought in all of these macaques with the idea that you weren't going to keep them all and they were there for so long. Well, we thought we could find a bigger place because I wasn't happy that we didn't have a larger space for them as you, I think what it was like uh, 10, 10 by 10, something like that and quite high, but still, and they could go in and out, but that's, there, there are better places. There are better. Uh, and Gaia yeah. and the other one were able to roam through the house, but the other four not. No, no, no. Okay. It would have been too much. Can you imagine having? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't imagine. <laughs> I'm sure no. that people will be laughing when, because you, they can be really destructive and they never would. They never were. Right. Right. Wow. So does anybody have anything that they want to ask Linda since she's here that we, you want to ask her burning questions about her story with these macaques, the, how, anything with the book, anything? Okay, so wait, Sandra, are you raising a hand? Uh, yeah, I don't have a lot of voice, but I was fascinated. I think that the reason it happened the way it was is Linda's, there was no fear. And I think that comes from the heart. Yep. Because fear comes in the brain. Yep. And, and when you don't use that brain fear and you just come from the heart, then I think that's a vibration, and I think that's an understanding. Um, because when I was a child, I approached all animals, no matter what, and people say to my mother, aren't you afraid she'll get hurt? My mother said, no, she's never been hurt, because she's not afraid. And, and it's, I think it's a really important point, and I still have to... Um, caution that how do you use that heart intelligence because there are some situations that wouldn't be safe and, and that is what I am really grateful for that I've been able to be very cognizant of where I can hold those infinite possibilities that it's okay and where can't I yeah. that's like it wouldn't have been okay for all six in there <laughs> So I think, I think for you, Linda, that's intuitive, and for a lot of people, it is an intuitive thing. It's it's not explainable. I mean, I just, I knew I just knew that the animals were safe. I don't think I would have approached otherwise. Right and to this day, I mean, I did it with some horses that I saw. Made sure they, well, if the fence wasn't electrified, this one horse put his whole head in my van, and just interacted with me. And my one yeah. friend those horses said, weren't you afraid? And I said, no, I didn't put that out there. Yeah. And we they, just, do, they, know, they do know when we're afraid. Yeah. I, I, way before tea touch and I was doing stuff with the horse's ears, but I didn't know what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And I was just touching his face very gently. And he left. Nice. And that was that. And don't you love the feeling it leaves you with after probably a long time? I was. I still am. It still amazes me. Yeah. It just amazes me still to this day. Because I didn't know that horse. Never saw him before. Have not seen him again. And he's always with you. Yes. Uh -huh. he is. I love that. That's on my bucket list. One day I want to ride a horse. I never have. But what I intend to sit on a horse. And Sandra, in the meantime, do it in your mind. I have. Good. Because actually going through these, some of these things that are in our bucket list, 
really in our mind really enhances our beings, our soul, and our health. And uh, in the latest Time magazine, there's a really interesting study that was done, I believe, in the UK, looking at the real value of being in nature and all the different ways. Did anyone else read that? It's really fascinating because many of us, I mean, I was recently asked, where am I the happiest? Where, if I, if I could go anywhere, it's in a, in a deep forest, you know, especially the, the old growth forest where you have this wonderful feeling of the earth. That is to me, that's where I'm the happiest. Mm. Or the most at peace. And, they, and there's actually then research on it, which I love. <laughs> Well, Linda, I want to tell you about that. In our little piece of land here, we created zero landfill, so we have no garbage. We have only recycling and only compost, no chemicals. And last week, we discovered a very large terrapin turtle living with us. Really? Yes. Oh, my gosh. And he's big. How big? And he, lives on the, he lives on the peripheral between our back area, which is grass, and our large area, which is most of our land is wooded. It's so we keep it that way. And so we think because of what we did, all these animals are coming to live there because it's safe. Yeah. And, water, and there's no chemicals, but this guy is beautiful. There. He's amazing. Wow. Sandra, thank you so much. You're welcome. Linda, we're, we're coming close to 5 o'clock. Ah. And before, um, before we end with the heart hug, because that's always, oh, I would like to um, discuss, we actually have a date <laughs> for the next book club next month. And that's going to be um, Rupert Isaacson, um, uh, his book, The Long Ride Home. And that's on Monday, August 22nd at 5 p.m. And uh, this is Rupert's second book on, uh, with his son um, with autism and his story. And it is really quite incredible. And so please put that on your calendar. And I will send out the, that invite again. That's uh, Monday, August 22nd at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Um, and Linda, I want to come back and say thank you so much for getting this book on the six yes. well, o'clock. Thank you. Thank so you, much. Carol. And thank you, you know, Deb Bauer for putting it in this format for us. And thank you, Shannon, for doing the cover for us. And thanks to Kate for her input that she had on the, on the cover and over all the years. So it was really, um, I'm, I'm really thrilled with it. And actually, it's Dr. D. Blanco in Santa Fe who came and did that homeopathic treatment. So I knew that name would come to me. And I, I just want to, want to thank you for being on the call. And it's going to be really interesting to see. I'm, I'm thrilled um, that we got it. And thank you as always. Thank you. And is everybody hands free that we you can take this time for Linda to guide you? Oh, yes. The yes, please. Okay. Yes, please. Yes, please. And I'm going to just mute a couple so that hold on, and then we'll all come back on. I just want to get the sound of Linda's voice guiding us. <laughs> so let's just pull, cup our hands gently and put them on our chest on our heart chakra. And imagine the face of a clock, because when we imagine, we activate this whole brain, both, you know, our left logical and our feeling, reasoning, intuitive. Right. And then just imagine the face of the clock, which is six o'clock toward the ground, 12 up toward the chin. And now, just whichever direction you prefer, go either left or right, from the six o'clock, very gently, move the skin just really gently in one direction or the other, one time and a quarter. Take a lovely deep, deep breath in through your nose and out gently through pursed lips again. Okay. 
And with each circle and a quarter at the end of the pause, at the pause, where we really pause, smile to activate the feel-good hormones, the serotonin, and send out love to all the animals. Just call them in one after another, all the animals who have touched your lives in a very special way. Imagine them in a circle above us, what I call the circle, the council of animals. All the animals who have graced our lives. One time and a quarter and a smile and a... And let's send, as animal ambassadors, we send love and gratitude to all of those animals and to all the animals who don't have anyone to appreciate them. Hmm? And just realize that as we do that, imagine this love coming back to all of us from this wonderful circle, this wonderful council of animals who've graced our lives with love. And one last circle in the quarter. And this time, as you breathe in and then out, send love through your 50 trillion cells for the amazing, brilliant, and wisdom that they're able to function in this state, in this frequency that keeps us able to be human. And I want, in these times that many of us are feeling, I want to remind us of this basic, beautiful concept that, hmm, we're not just humans with a soul. We're actually a soul living a human experience. Blessings to you all. <laughs> and to all the animals who are here with us. And aloha. Thanks. Aloha, Linda.